unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Matthew chapter 11, the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 11, the 28th verse. And it reads, Come unto me, all ye who labor. Come unto me, all ye who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, he says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you, he says, shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Today I want to talk about a very important aspect of faith. Okay, and for those of you who have been following from the time we went into this season, uh, the Lord very clearly impressed it on my heart that this season, more than ever before, star the hearts of people into the place of faith they must be because after this season a lot is going to happen but many people who are aligned into the spirit of faith are going to see harvest redemptions glories graces like they have never seen before all their lives in every season of casting down there's always a rising up of the children of god and so it's expedient in this hour to position ourselves to know what is expected of us and to do what must be done in this period because i feel more than ever before the power of influence is on the door and many things after this season are going to position our voices many of us our careers the works of our hands our revelations our visions you know, our gifts, our talents, our callings are going to be positioned in a light that is so bright and undeniable. And I feel that after this season, many people are going to come out with a certain grace that is going to attract things that you could not have attracted in your normal predictable life for the next 20 or 40 years, or even of your own life existence. I feel that this season is going to surprise many. Already people have been sending me text messages of things that are happening in this period. Recently, I received a text message of somebody who got one of the biggest business deals of their lifetime in this period. I see that God is positioning us, and I'm excited for what he's doing. So my instruction to you, as was received by God, is that we have to position ourselves in faith, 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 build ourselves. And so all through, you're going to see me touch different facets of faith, okay? And tonight, I want to touch a very important aspect of our faith. It follows through some of the counseling sessions that I've had with people. And some ask questions, okay? And in some of those, every time I'm trying to answer a different aspect of why our faith is not working, because I've constantly had questions from people whose faith has not worked. And they call it faith has not worked. And so I felt in my heart that I would carry on a line of teaching different aspects of faith all through in this season that sort of help us have a completion in understanding a perfection, if you may say, in our interpretation of faith, okay? And uh, one of the aspects that I see that completes faith, and many people have failed to exercise themselves in the same, is rest, rest, you know? But tonight I want to give you another eye of understanding when it comes to the rest of the spirit. Now, when we read from Matthew 11, when Jesus speaks, addressing particularly to people who are laboring a lot, people who are heavy laden in this walk, and he's saying, 
Come so I may give you rest. Come so I may firstly give you rest. Because he says my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Learn of me. Learn of me. There's a meekness and lowliness in my heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Salvation is supposed to be easy. Our faith is supposed to be a light burden. Okay? I have been in places where I've had people say, from the time I got born again, everything started to go down. And so they go for counseling and they ask their men of God, man of God, why are things going so well? Then the men of God say, you know, when you get born again, Satan, of course, attacks those who are not his. And so because Satan attacks those who are not his, you're in a period that you're being attacked and attacked and attacked and attacked because you don't belong to the devil. But I belong to God now. <laughs> I belong to God now. I say I belong to God now. And I think in my heart that if I belong to God now, then suffering should not be as much as it was when I was in the world. All right? But I've had people say, oh, from the time I got born again, my finances hit shipwreck. No, it's not that your salvation brought that. It's because you entered a field and you have not been taught how to play by its rules. You enter the game and you do not know how to play by its rules. That's all. But if you're taught how to play by the rules, if you're taught how to play by the book, salvation is one of the easiest lives to live. It's one of the greatest greatest experiences to live and our life of faith cannot be completed without the aspect of rest we must know how to live in rest because i've seen people who say they're exercising faith but with a very anxious attitude they say they are living and walking the life of faith but with a very restless attitude with a very anxious life with a very unstable living okay but they say that they are believing god but tonight i want to show you what rest does the power of rest i wish you to understand that your faith and i want you to note that cannot be complete without rest your faith cannot be complete without the application of rest you must know how to rest you must know how to find rest Jesus is trying to help men here in Matthew 11:28 to find rest. He intends to give you rest because he knows what rest will do in your life. Rest is a must for every believer. In fact, if we get into the realm of human life, okay, even scientists will tell you that a man needs rest to move to the next day. You need rest to function. You need rest to refill and rejuvenate and realign. In fact, I read of a very interesting story of uh, this world athlete, the record breaker called Usain Bolt. Okay? Usain Bolt has broken literally all the records of the fastest man that has ever lived. He's the fastest man, at least by record, that we know that has ever lived. He ran 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. So that's very fast. And his coach actually tells you he could have ran it faster if he had not celebrated Okay, but the story of this fellow is one, there was a seed that was sowed into him when he was little in Usain Bolt's life. Uh, one of those days, there was a young man in the area where he was raised was very fast, he was a very fast young man. There was a local priest that finds these two boys uh, bickering over each other. You know, Usain is saying, I can run faster than you, and this young man is saying, but hey, nobody runs faster than me, and so they start bickering, they go on to and fro, you know, fighting through on that. And then this local priest tells them, okay, uh, let's settle this bet. I'm going to give lunch to whoever runs fastest. And so Usain Bolt gets on the line with this little boy, the young man that he was raised with. I was probably at the age of 12. And so they sprint. And in sprinting, Usain Bolt wins the race. And so this priest uh, calls this young man and the sergeant tells him, look, if you can beat this man, I believe that you can run faster than anyone that has ever lived or lives or is alive now of course everybody will ask this local priest how would he know who is running faster why would you get a 12 year old compare him with his peer 
and then tell him that if you've run faster than this fellow, you can run faster than anybody that is alive, okay? It would be a bit far-fetched if you look at it philosophically, scientifically, you know, if you reason it out, it's not something that actually would carry because we're not sure then that the man uh, Usain Bolt ran against was the fastest young man of that time, okay? He wasn't on records, he was not on television, he was nowhere. But a seed was planted in this young man to believe that if you can actually run faster than this one, you can run faster than anyone alive. So he starts going on the tracks to train, all right? And so in his age of 15, he starts, you know, winning a few things. But in his story as he grows up, they realize that the potential was there with the same boat. But there was a certain speed he failed to attain. Although later when he meets his coach, who helps him win the records that he won, when he meets him, the coach sees that this boy has the potential of breaking world records. But there was a way he had failed to attain a certain speed. He had failed to attain a certain speed. There was something in the mechanics that was not working right. And so after searching himself, the story is given of the coach. The coach discovered that Bolt was not resting enough. So the coach tells Bolt that part of your training regiment will be to rest. If you do not rest, you will not run at the speed I want you to. So of course, there was a little hesitation. How does that work with my speed and what, but he had a coach, he trusted. And so the story is given that so when Hussein learned to rest, when he learned to sleep a bit more than usual, his speed started increasing. The more he learned to sleep more, the more his speed started to increase. In fact, it is said that at the times Hussein Bolt has broken records before, three or four times of those times he broke records, he slept longest. <laughs> He slept longest. It's part actually of professional athletes. Long sleep is part of training. In fact, I read somewhere that the NBA player, legend, uh, LeBron, he sleeps for about 12 hours of the 24. Roger Federer sleeps for 12 hours. Serena Williams sleeps for 10 hours. Rafael Nadal, he sleeps for about 11 or 12 hours. I read about all these guys and I discovered that now part of their training is actually sleeping. They sleep. And this is teaching us something, that you can only run as fast and as much as you can rest. You can only run as fast and as much as you can rest. They've discovered that athletes are most efficient if they learn to rest. Now that is for the world. But there's something that carries meaning for when it comes to the spiritual. In other words, the quickening of the spirit can only have that effect in your life when you learn to rest in your spirit. In your spirit. For the professional athletes in the world, it's just sleeping, okay? Now, of course, people quote the scripture of Proverbs, a little sleep and a little slumber, and poverty will pounce on you. Now, if you read that portion of scripture, you'll actually realize that that portion of scripture, the warning given to the sleep and slumber and poverty was actually to a sluggard. If you read in the verses before, God was addressing a sluggard, a slothful person, lazy people. That's why he says, so how long will you sleep, O oh sluggard? He's talking about people who are so lazy, they have nothing, they do nothing, they're lazy people. They're very relaxed people. And because of that laziness, they sleep. And in that sleep, they become poor. That is different. That is not for active people. That is not for people who are applying themselves. That is not for hard workers. That is not for committed people. That is not for people who are on the road. No, poverty hits sluggard, slothful men when they sleep. This particular rest is for men who have an activity, who are aligned to something that they are doing. Okay? That is why in Psalms 127, the Bible says, For he grants sleep for those he loves. He says, For it is useless for you to wake up uh, late at night and do this and do that. He says, For he grants sleep for them that he loves. Okay? He's talking about people who are rested in him. It doesn't mean that he's talking about irresponsible people. When I'm talking about this rest, I'm not saying wake up in the morning, uh, sit there the whole day, and then sleep the whole day for two, three, four, five days, and then somehow miracles will start happening in your life. No, we're defining the rest of the spirit, the sabbat of the spirit, you know, the rest of God and how it's understood in the resting of God. That is what we're talking about. We're not just talking about 
the lazy spirit. Because if a lazy spirit catches sleep, that one is going to die. We're talking about a hard worker, a laborer, somebody who is committed, you know, to applying not only in the physical realm, but there are people who are active in the spiritual, right? He's saying God is not taking away your activity in the spirit, but he's saying you must learn to attune your activity in his rest. You must understand the purpose of rest in your spiritual activity. You understand? So he's not saying don't pray. He's saying pray in rest. He's not saying don't fast. He's saying no, fast in rest. He's not saying don't preach. No, he's saying preach in rest. He's not saying now stop being a hard worker and just chill. No, he's saying be the hardest worker they could be to the glory of God. But work in rest. Work in rest. And so there's an irony there. Okay, there's a paradox. How do I rest and yet become the hardest worker? Uh, how do I find rest and yet I'm the deepest applicator? How do I have much activity? But in my activity, then there is rest. In God, it's actually possible. But more than that, it's a prerequisite. It's a requirement. It's that unavailable thing that every believer must know how to work around. And I have seen in my personal life that when I started to design that rest, when I started to connect to that rest, many things started to become so easy for me. So easy for me. So easy for me. It's refreshing that comes from God. Because I know resting. I know what it means to rest by the Spirit. So I want to teach some of you, and it doesn't mean that I'm not a hard worker. I'm a hard worker. I'm a hard worker. I read. I apply myself to things. I speak in tongues. I pray. I commit myself to a lot. In most of my time, I'm actually in the presence of God. I've learned how to cultivate that presence, even when I'm in public. I know how to keep that place of solitude with my God. But I have learned to also work and minister in rest. And that is what I want to teach you. I want to show you the power of that. Let's open Hebrews chapter 4, verses 2. Let's read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 2. The Bible says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Now he's talking about the people of old. Okay? That they received the gospel the same way you and I received it, he said. They received the message the same way you and I received it, he said. For unto us the gospel was preached as well as unto them. But the Bible says, But the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that had it. Okay? The gospel was preached. The gospel was preached. And Paul is telling us in Hebrews that it's possible for actually someone to receive the gospel for two, three, four people, a thousand, ten thousand people to sit in the same meeting where faith is being taught and it's activated in one man and then it does not activate in another. Because this one man does not know how to apply that faith. But another one knows how to connect to that faith being given through the word. All right? And in the third verse he says, For we, now he's explaining why their faith was not complete. All right? He says, For we which have believed. Eh? The Bible says, We do enter into rest. We which have believed. He said, We do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Okay? And the fourth verse says that for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. He's trying to say, look, the people that did not receive the results of the word, they did not receive the results of the word because they did not mix it with faith. All right? But then in the next verse, Paul tries to explain that in this mixing it with faith, in this particular faith, he brings in a very important aspect, which is rest. He says, for us who understand this faith, we have understood this faith, that he which has believed enters a certain rest. That means maybe, or practically speaking, in the teachings that they received, they could have had a mind of we believe that actually what God has said is true, or that we trust that his word is going to carry out. But there was a certain missing ingredient, and Paul is trying to give us that missing ingredient, and he's saying, no, the missing ingredient was faith. Now he's saying, it did not work for them. But for us it is working, because we who have believed, unlike them who didn't believe, 
We enter the particular rest. We enter the particular rest. It is for the works from the foundation of the world were finished. Everything that you need for your glory, for your increase, for your power, for your testimony, for your miracle, was finished long ago. You were blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You were given everything that pertains to life and godliness. Don't think God did not know that COVID seasons would come. He knew COVID seasons would come. He knew wars will come. He knew you'd be born in the third world for those of you who are living in the third world. He knew that you'd have a less education than what you needed. He knew that probably you'd be married to that spouse. He knew that you'd have those kinds of children. He knew you'd be born by those parents. He knew that your genes would be funny and that you'd come from a generation of people that had diabetes. He knew all that. But the Bible says he still provided for your fullness and completion way before the foundation of the world. The Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. The salvation story existed way before the foundation of the world. In Revelation 13 verse 8, he says the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Your salvation story was provided for way before. He knew that you'd be born by parents who had sickle cell carriers and the bisco cell in your body. But he had provided for it long ago. What you're not connecting to is that this is not about your future. This is about what was already done in the past to define your future. It's not your next day. It's what your past has already provided for to give comfort to your next day. That is why I don't worry about my next week, my next year, my 20 years. When you enter that faith, you stop worrying, what will I do next Sunday? What will I do when, you know, COVID is out? How will I get fees for my children? How will I start my business? My business is on zero. How? Oh, breathe in and out. Rest. Rest. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. Everything was finished. So everything, when we apply ourselves and work hard, all these labors that we're doing, they're all attuned to a certain end, which was already finished. So we don't labor to earn. No, we labor because we have earned in Christ. We labor because we have earned in Christ. We work hard because we know the end of that work is we have attained in Christ already. We don't work as those who should attain. That's works, all right? And then Paul goes deep into explaining this and says, no, even deeper, even God rested, even God, creator of heaven and earth, he spake in a certain place, the Bible says, of the seventh day, and on this wise God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. And let me explain this rest, because some people attune it to a day, they put it on a day, this day, on the seventh day, Adventist. And I always tell people, the day of the Lord is not the days of men. The day of the Lord is not the days of men. And that is why the Pharisees had a problem. Why has he healed on the Sabbath? Why has he done this on the Sabbath? Why has he done this on the Sabbath? Because they don't understand that God's revelation of the Sabbath, the rest, is in his day of rest, not the days of men of rest, which is in Genesis 1.14. He made stars and the moon and all the constellations of the earth that they should divide there and moon for signs and seasons and days and years for in the lives of men. Those lights, that were created for the years of men are different from the light that was created by God and the days of God because those lights were created on the fourth day of God. Okay, In Genesis chapter 1, you see God creating. He created all things. Genesis chapter 1 ends on the sixth day after all had been created. All right, And on the seventh day, the Bible says the heaven and earth were finished and all the host of them. And because of that, God ended his work which he had made in verses 2 and rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made, okay? I want you to understand this rest we're talking about. God created in the spirit all the things that must be created in the spirit, and after creating all those things in the spirit, on the sixth day, on the seventh day, Genesis 2, 2, he rested from the things he has created in the spirit. So that means when we create in the spirit, the next thing that has to follow after creating in the spirit is rest. He rested from his works. And you see that from that rest, after that rest in verses 3, okay, he continues to now say the blessing. Huh? He speaks a blessing over the seventh day and sanctifies it. Okay? And he sanctifies that particular day because he rested in that day from his works. From then on, after that rest, 
we start to see now God enter the realm of forming. The language now gets to formation. Verse 7, and now God formed man from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And that man became a living soul. All right? And then he formed the beasts. And then he formed the plants. And then he formed this. And then he formed that. And then he formed that. And then he formed all of these things. He started formation, okay? I hope you're following the pattern here. Creation, rest, formation. All right? Creation, rest, manifestation. So between creation, spiritual, and manifestation, physical, is rest. So God is saying, my creation story would not be complete whatever created in the spiritual can only translate into the physical realm of formation when there is rest and he blessed the rest he's trying to tell you he's giving the church a pattern for example the bible says that meditate all right so you learn to meditate you meditate on the word of god all right then you think on the word of god because there's power in meditation i'm just giving an example there's power in meditation so you start meditating on the word of god you start thinking on the word of god all right and then you give yourself wholly to those words and as you're meditating, you're creating images. You're speaking as you're creating. You're speaking as you're creating. Your mind is a creative force, all right? They are held in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him for they do trust him, all right? Your mind is creating. You're imagining your family. You're imagining your children. You're imagining your future. You're imagining your career. You're imagining, you know, the increase, the multiplication in your life. You're imagining your ministry, you're doing all of these imaginations and creating by speaking forth the word, you're proclaiming, because part of your creative process is your thought and your speech, all right? Your thought and your speech, your meditation and your speech. We create through meditation and speech. Even God did that. He said, let there be light. That was creative force, all right? And light was, and day and night are separated. Let there be, let there be. God is speaking, let there be. He's creating as he thinks. He's creating as his thoughts are mutating. He's creating as his thoughts are changing and moving to and fro and imagining whatever he wants. He's creating that. And in his imagination is the creative force to know that. He says, let there be light. Light knows what it is because there's creativity in just what God thinks. Okay? So to think and to speak, you're creating. All right? And he's saying that as you're speaking and creating, speaking and creating, he's saying it's not going to get to a place of transfer formation into the physical, of metamorphosis into the physical, of change into the physical, of transposition into the physical, of transcending into the physical, of manifestation into the physical realm if you don't put rest somewhere. Because God did it and he blessed it. He's saying this is the only way we effect results in the physical realm. Christians have learned the art of confession. Christians have learned the art of thought, thinking right, they're thinking right, they're confessing right, but they don't know how to rest. They don't know how to rest in the spirit, okay? I'm going to explain that. They don't know how to rest in the spirit. For example, you get a very bad report about a very sick person. Oh, my God, let's pray, let's pray. Or you call a pastor, pastor, let's pray. And then you start praying. And then you believe, you cast out, you cleanse, you rebuke devils, and then you do that, all right? Then after that prayer, you stay anxious. You stay restless. You stay insecure. You have prayed, you have done all of these things, but your mind still sees your relative die. Your mind still sees your relative in the coffin. You see yourselves in the village. You prepare for death. You do all of that. How then do you expect for that prayer you have made to translate to healing in the physical realm? That's not how it works. So he says, be anxious about nothing with thanksgiving. Make your requests known unto God. Make your requests known unto God. With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. And in the seventh verse of Philippians 4, 7, he says, and that peace of God, you see, the peace of God, that rest, which passes all understanding when you have prayed that way, with thanksgiving. He says, shall God your heart and mind in Christ. In other words, your mind and heart are agreed to the word. That's a man resting. That's a man resting. And because your heart and mind, the meditations of your heart, the thoughts of your mind, are agreed 
in Christ to the prayer that you have made, you find peace. When you start feeling that peace in your mind and in your heart about the issue you've prayed for, oh, you are resting. That's it, right there. You are resting. You are resting. Jehovah God created peace in him after creating everything. Because if God subjected himself to that law, oh, if God, Jehovah God, who didn't need to, subjected himself to that law for your learning, I believe he didn't need to rest. But he created that law and he subjected himself to that law as well. And he rested. And then after resting, we shifted from creation to formation. Created man in 126, 27, formed man in Genesis 2, 7 out of dust and breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. You see the beasts that were created in Genesis chapter 1, they start manifesting. The plants that were created, uh, every seed after its own kind in Genesis 1, they start coming out, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, whatever, the living creatures that were created in Genesis 1, they start getting their formation in Genesis 2. But the middle part here had to be rest. It had to be rest. So if I'm praying for a sick person, I must labor to enter into rest. How? If I've prayed and I've believed that they're healed, then there's a peace I must find. There's a peace that I must find. There's a peace I must find. There's a rest I must find. And that rest means that my mind is not going to wrestle with failure. My mind is not going to fight with the demise of this person I've prayed for, my heart is not going to be restless. If it should be that the Lord is going to take that person and it's just their time to go, after prayer, you will feel that peace to release them. You'll feel that peace to let them go. You'll find the peace to say it is done. All right? But there's a reason why he said that your days on earth I shall make full. Your days on the earth I shall make full. And I feel instructed by God to say this. Forever is listening. I feel the Spirit of God prompt me to say, I'll give you a full life. I heard the rhema of the Spirit start in me, so strong to tell somebody, I will give you a full life. Full life. You'll see your children. You'll see your grandchildren. You'll see your great-grandchildren. And it shall be a life of health. Receive it in Jesus' name. Receive it. It's a prophetic word. Receive it. So back to this. You find some people, for example, doing businesses. Oh, you're in trouble. Your business is going to collapse. Da, 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 da. And then they get all these funny reports. You're going to prison tomorrow. Da, 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 da. And then they go to pray. And then they pray and pray and pray about this. And then after that, they say, oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. But I must also pray that thank you, Lord. But I'm grateful this is going to happen. Then they call another pastor. Then they call an evangelist. Then they call an apostle. Then they call a prophet. Then they call intercessors. Then they call their mother's pastor. Then they call their uncle's intercessor. Then they call their cousin who they know is also born again. Thank God with me. Thank God. But inside there, let me tell you, the man who prays for you better have that rest. <laughs> because somebody in that equation of corporate prayer needs the application of that rest and the formation and manifestation of that miracle, you know, will be best on the most rested person in that prayer. Woe to you if you pray with a thousand people and they're all without rest. Because one man with rest makes the difference. Some people send me very hard text messages of fear. And sometimes I tell them, will you firstly rest? Will you first rest? Some of you who have sent me those messages will attest that many of those times I have told you to rest, things have happened for you. And I've received many testimonies upon testimonies of people. And it's simple. I just gave them the simplest instruction of what I know how has worked. You know, there are times I remember... I got one day a very bad report, a very bad report, and the Spirit told me, do what you always do, just go rest. So I went to my bed, I started speaking in tongues, 
I applied myself to the resting of the spirit. Coincidentally, I also fell asleep, which was part of my physical rest as well. And when I woke up, it was gone. Everything had changed within that one hour of my spiritual rest, but also my bodily rest. Some of you, I think, have also attested to experiences where you're troubled about something and you go to sleep and wake up, and somehow it's lighter than the way you went to sleep. Yeah, but most importantly, more than just the rest of your body, may God help you know how to rest your soul. Jesus says, and I will give rest to your souls. I'll give rest to your souls. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 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 Oh, I wish somebody understood. This is gold. This is gold. This is a sermon. In its simplicity, you should listen two, four, five times and get this. And get this. This is not something your mind should understand. This is something your soul, your spirit should connect to so deeply. You will understand the apocalypsis and the funero of things, the unveiling of the spiritual and the manifestation of that. Because many people are struggling to translate what they have seen in the spirit, what they have dreamt. Some of you have dreamt dreams that are so big. Some of you prophets spoke over your lives, all right, and they prophesied things over your lives. Uh, men of God have declared things over your lives. Some of you are in service and you hear a word and you say, this is mine. And you even leave that meeting saying, today this is mine. But it never comes to pass. Why? Because you left out the most important ingredient, the rest. If you do not learn to rest, you will not translate the spiritual into the physical. And what is it to rest? To rest is the finding of that peace in your mind and in your heart. After you have told God everything, everything that you believe for, and that peace can only begin with gratitude, thanksgiving. How do you work yourself to that peace? Thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Then you draw images of the finished work. You draw images of the works that were finished from the foundation of the world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You start joining in the Lord. You thank and joy until you can believe it. The peace comes. The peace comes. Because you know it's God. This is God. This is God. What if it doesn't work? Uh, 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 how can it not work? He has said if you find rest, it will work. If you find rest, it will work. You see? So, Let's continue with our reading. The Bible says, in verses 4, he spoke in a certain place for a certain day on the wise, and God did rest in a certain day from all his works. And verse 5 says, and in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest, he said, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. They must. It's a must. And they to whom it was first preached, the Bible says, entered not in because of unbelief. So you see, he's taken us back why their faith did not work. They did not mix it with faith because they tried to apply themselves to a God in whom they could not find rest. Right? So he says, and they to whom it was first preached, the gospel was preached to them, but they did not enter into rest because of unbelief. Right? So he's saying, because the rest was not complete, to God it stayed unbelief. Don't think that they did not trust God in your definitions of trusting or that they did not believe in your definition of believing. But Paul is saying because they did not enter into the rest of God, they were still in unbelief. So to God, if you're not rested, you're still in unbelief. It doesn't matter how much confession, how much drama you put around you. All right? And verse 7 says, again, he says, he limited a certain day saying in David, today after so long a time, it is said today if you will hear his voice and harden not your hearts, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. All right? And in verses 9, it says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. There remaineth a rest to the people of God. He says, For he that entereth into rest, he also, the Bible says, has ceased from his own works as God did. He has ceased from his own works. And what are those works? The works of confession the works of meditation, in the creative, right, in the creative uh, faculties, 
all right? It's not about you ceasing to meditate and confess. In rest and peace, we confess and rest. But the works of creation, when you have already created, he says, you cease from your own works. Then you enter the rest of God, as God did from his, verses 11. He's saying, let us labor, therefore, that we may enter into that rest. As interesting as this godly rest is, you don't slide into it. You labor into it. That means that there's an effort of your spirit to exercise yourself into that. And that is thanksgiving, gratitude, praising God, enjoying in God, and refusing to take your mind back to the problem, refusing to take your mind back to the challenge, refusing to take your mind back to the insecurity, refusing to take your mind back to the predicament, and then choosing to refuse to think negative of that issue again because you've prayed about it. And it says, we shall enter into that rest, lest any fall after the same example of unbelief. That means if you do not rest, you do not carry belief. In Exodus 33 verses 14, he's speaking to Moses, and he makes a very fundamental statement. Moses is fearing, will you go with me? If you don't go with me, if your presence is not with me, how shall we go? And da, 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 da. And God makes a very, very powerful statement. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Let me explain what that means. It means that the presence of God nurtures rest. The presence of God nurtures rest. It draws boundaries that form rest. Rest is from the presence. When God gives you his presence, the one underlying principle that forms out of this presence, the one underlying element that comes out of this presence, the one underlying life that erects out of this presence is rest. He says, my presence will go with you, comma, and I will give you rest. All right. The presence of God is most defined on a man when that man has found rest. When you find that peace. When you find that peace. You know, there's a song called Boundless Love. In one of those verses, it says, In your fullness I will rest. I find my peace beneath the cross. Knowing you, my one desire, take me now to where you are. There's that fullness in which you find rest. You find rest. You rest in the fullness of his presence. When you find a man who is rested, you find a man to whom the presence of God is surrounding. You're talking of a man to whom the presence of God has filled, right? And he's saying that my presence is where my rest is and my rest is where my presence is. There is something about the presence of God. And that is one thing I also want to leave with you. To enter into rest, practice the presence of God. Practice the presence of God. And say, so how do I practice that? Simple. Exercise yourself to that consciousness. Elevate yourself to the knowledge of his presence and what that presence does. You know, I've seen miracles. I've seen things that have happened, okay? But there is just something about connecting to the presence of God until that rest comes. Sometimes when I lay hands on people, say I have a broken hand, a broken leg, when I close my eyes and I start to pray, I start to see God creating. I start to see God putting that bone back in order. There's that point when it clicks and I feel the peace of God flooding over my soul. And his rest in the knowledge that it is done. The moment I see that in the spirit, I usually tell them, check yourself. Check yourself. And I see this person saying, oh, the pain has gone. It is gone. I don't feel pain. And they start walking. That physical manifestation began with me creating that healing by faith in seeing Christ and what he has done and then transposing into that rest. The moment that rest comes through, I know it's done. 
there are things that I have seen and that people have prayed for and they've even worsened. But I don't fear that they will die because I know. A lady called me recently and told me of a mother who had had a clot in the head and a stroke through, I think, on one side of the body. And I told her sister, put on loud speak and we started praying. And we prayed and we prayed. As we were praying, the presence just continued feeling and saturating my spirit. And I felt they were connecting to it. And in the midst of that, that peace just came over me woof, and flooded over my spirit. And the moment it did, I told the lady, find rest. Your mom is not only going to get off that oxygen, because the mom, I think, was in ICU, but she will move, she will leave, she will heal. Rest. Thank you, Apostle. Every day from that day of prayer, she was sending me text messages of now she's off oxygen, now this is gone, now she's moving her leg, now she's moving her hand, now she's starting to do this, now she's starting to do that. The creative miracle started to go into this woman's body. Why? Because somewhere in that equation we had found rest. Listen, those of you who are watching me. Find rest. Find rest. Find rest. Open your mouth right now and start to speak. Just proclaim words in the air of rest. Whatever has been troubling you, I know you've prayed about it already. Now I want you with gratitude, exercise your faith in gratitude and thanksgiving. And focus on the presence. Align your conscience to the fact that Christ is with you, in you, the hope of glory. And just thank him. Thank him for your joy. Thank him that it is well with your business. Thank him that it is well with your marriage. Thank him that it is well with your health. Oh, healing is taking place right now. Our heart disease is getting healed. Kidneys are getting healed. Ah, karabaka talapaya rabako shatalapakashi. Oh, shabaka ta ku talabaya. Randa labaza la katalapaya kubu ku shitalabaya. Esere rebaka talapaya kuja labayata. Kendele baka talapaya bakusha. Somebody's ministry right now is getting restored. Your ministry is getting restored. Katolo baka brazalaba. Born issues, back issues. Check your back. God is healing back issues right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak on your finances and I decree and I declare that you're going to come out better with this season in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for all that you've done even beyond what I said right now. Thank you because things are translating now to formation in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And if you're there and you've never given your life to Christ or received him as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity the greatest opportunity. This man died. He shed his blood for you. He came. He said, come to me. I will give you rest. He's going to give you rest. He will rest your soul. He'll rest your emptiness. He'll feel it. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, today I have believed that you died and rose again for me. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.